Hey guys, um, I decided to go ahead and record today's class just in case we have some issues with Zoom due to weather moving in tonight and in the morning. Um, that happens quite often whenever bad weather rolls through that students have a hard time connecting or their internet issues, things like that. So I wanted to make sure that I got today's lecture recorded um, as a backup plan. All right, so today I want to talk to you about storytelling, um, implicit versus implicit values, how you can recognize them in the readings that you're doing um, so that you can then come up with strategies that you can apply to your own writing and your own storytelling. We're going to talk about a couple things today. Malcolm X is a homemade education and the Game of Thrones reading that you did for homework. All right, so today's calendar view. Um, it turns out that on Thursday, I had the wrong calendar view up. So my apologies for that. Um, hopefully you did click on today's calendar date and get this um, record, this view. All right, so um, for homework, I asked you guys to continue working on developing ideas through, for your unit one projects. Do some pre-writing. Think about some of those past experiences that have shaped your value. Um, and to remember that you're thinking critically about these experiences. So you're not just telling us your story, but you're thinking about how it made you feel, um, how you responded, why you felt and responded to the events that were happening in the way that you did. And of course, to review that Malcolm X reading that you did last week um, as an example of critical narrative. Additionally, I asked you to read the Game of Thrones chapter one reading. Um, hopefully you found that pretty easily. Um, if you didn't, um, you can easily Google this, right? And go and read it and then come back and look at these pages to kind of help you look for ways that values are often implied, right? Sometimes we can, we're gonna come right out and say, this is my value. This value was shaped in this way. Um, but a lot of times it's gonna be implied in our language choices. The reader is gonna see it. They're gonna know what values you're talking about based on the way that you are telling the story. Okay, and that's what we're gonna look at in that Game of Thrones reading. And then chapter seven, planning and replanning. Um, this is really important because it's going to give you a lot of different strategies that might be useful for you um, when you're working on unit one. All right, and then you have an assignment due before the end of the day today called value exploration. Um, so in this assignment, I want you to draft a one or two sentence working line of inquiry that can help you explore a single value in depth. Um, so it should make sure, it should make clear uh, what value you're gonna write about in the unit one essay. And then you're gonna write a short paragraph explaining the experiences and beliefs that have helped form, mold, or define your value. All right, so make sure that you get that done and turned in before midnight. And of course, reach out to me if you have any kind of problems. Whenever I assign you guys a reading, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about the ideas of the reading and the storyline and things like that, okay? Um, because that's not always the purpose. Great if you took something else from it. But the reason that I'm giving you these examples is for strategies, writing strategies, um, because that's what this is. It's a writing class, okay? But just a little bit of information because, you know, obviously we need to, you know, know who these people are that we're reading about. I recommend that you always look them up, get a, get a quick little insight. Even if you don't have to spend a lot of time researching these writers, um, at least know who they are, like something basic if you don't already know. So Malcolm X, um, A Homemade Education, was what you read for an example of nonfiction critical narrative. All right. And that's what you are writing for unit one. You are writing a nonfiction critical narrative because you're going to be talking about your past experiences, real life stuff that has happened um, and you're going to be looking at it critically. You're going to be digging deep behind those memories and those experiences you've had in order to really demonstrate an understanding of how your beliefs and your values have come to be formed. All right. And we see that happening in the reading by Malcolm X. Now, some of you probably know who Malcolm X is, I would think. Um, but 
you may not have read anything by him before. I find that's often the case in this class is that students have heard this name, um, but they've never read anything. And that is because um, although he is a very popular and well-known human rights um, leader during the civil rights uh, movement, civil rights leader, um, we are more familiar usually with the works of Martin Luther King Jr., who is also a civil rights leader at this time. And those are usually what get read like in high school. I mean, I know that was the case when I was in high school. It was the, that was the case at the high school that I taught at. Um, it's just more common to read the works of Martin Luther King Jr. in those settings than Malcolm X. And Malcolm X, um, I think a lot of that is probably because he has long been considered more of a controversial figure than um, like a Martin Luther King Jr. Now, we're not here to debate that, okay? The point for this is for you to get some insight where you can see, okay, we do have this figure that is pretty well known. I want to know what has shaped your values what made you who you are or make made you hold the beliefs that you have what experiences okay because that's the kind of work that you're doing now in his read in this reading okay we get that example of critical narrative that you need because that's what you're writing um we see the evolution of values so we can see you know kind of how he started in this one place and what he was feeling along the way um, to where he ended up, right? We see the evolution and I want to see the evolution of your value. Um, we see somebody writing with a very colloquial tone. So it's just like everyday, you know, type of language. Um, that's what we mean by colloquial. Um, it's the way that we speak, right? If I'm sitting down to give a lecture to colleagues about a particular text, I might use different types of language that I know they already know and understand. But if I'm sitting down with my children at dinner to talk about a book um, that, you know, a similar text, I might choose some different words, right? I'm going to speak more colloquially. I'm going to speak as mom at home um, in just kind of a natural tone so that you know they can better understand me and we get a lot of that in this reading by Malcolm X it's easy to access it doesn't feel like an academic essay that's very hard to understand it's very personal okay I've had a lot of students um, in this unit one essay that write start writing their rough draft or putting all their stories together their story and they say oh I just feel like it's way too personal um, that's going to happen. That's normal. You are writing a nonfiction critical narrative about yourself. So of course it's going to be personal. Um, in Malcolm X's paper, he's in prison, right? He's talking about his experiences in prison, um, about not being educated and wanting to become educated, right? Uh, being frustrated, you know, at not having more of an education. And so, yeah, that's personal. Um, but because it's personal, that's why it is unique to the writer. That's why I get to see something that I otherwise can never know anything about. Even if I'm in the same position as the writer, or I know somebody in that same position, or I read something written by another person who was in prison and learned and became educated. It's not going to be the same, right? Because his experiences are unique to him. And that gives me very unique insight. I'm now thinking about this idea of education in a different way. He adds something to it for me. Um, some of the books that he talks about reading, maybe I've read some of those books, but I might go, wait a minute, when I read that, it didn't make me feel that way. I wonder why. Um, and that's what I mean by experiences that are unique to the writer and why this type of work is so important is because you might just say one thing that gets your reader thinking, well, I don't feel that way when I have that experience. So what can that tell me about myself? What can it tell me about you? What can it tell me about the world or the societies that we live in? Okay, so that's why it's really important that you are allowing yourself to, to, to write personal stories. Um, 
and to give us details and emotions, ways that you felt about particular experiences or in particular moments um, so that we can really come to develop a unique understanding of this value that you're sharing and how it came to be for you. Okay, so those are some things that um, I'm hopeful that you took away from that Malcolm X reading and that you can go back to it to see how he did it. Um, look at the details that he uses, okay? And the way that he shows us the evolution of this value. So I'm, we don't have time to go through this entire text, okay? I wish we did have time to go through all the things that you guys read, but we just don't. Um, but if you look at, you know, that moment in the text pretty early on where he says, you know, it really began back in Charlestown prison um, when Bimby, we don't know who that is, but that's okay, first made me feel envy of his stock of knowledge. When I first was, you know, frustrated at this other person, how much they knew. Bimby had always taken charge of any conversation he was in, and I had tried to emulate him. But every book I picked up had few sentences which didn't contain anywhere from one to nearly all of the words that might as well have been in Chinese. So I, you know, I wanted to be like that guy. He knew a lot of stuff. Um, and he took charge of conversations and people liked to listen to him. He was a powerful speaker. I wanted to be like that. But when I picked up books and tried to read and develop more knowledge, I struggled. There were so many words that I didn't understand. They may as well have been in a foreign language. When I skipped those words, because that's what we do, right? You know, skip over the words we don't know. Um, there were so many that I had to skip that I ended up not knowing much about what was being said in the book. So I had come to the Norfolk prison colony, still going through only book reading motions. So when I came to this other prison colony, um, I was trying to read books, but I wasn't really reading books. I wasn't learning. Pretty soon I would have quit even these motions unless I had received the motivations that I did, right? So he tells us like, I, I tried, I, I started out with this feeling of envy. I wanted to be like that. I tried, I wasn't being successful. Um, I just kind of went through the motions for a while. Um, and then I, I transferred to this other place, still going through the motions. And I was just about ready to quit, but then something happened. Okay, that's storytelling. Because if we get to that section and we're going, okay, you're gonna quit, but oh, now something's happened. What, like what happened, right? Now I need to know, um, what happened. Um, so I'm now I'm going to keep reading. That's what good writers do. We write in a way that hooks our reader, that demands that um, they tell us what's happened. I woke up the next morning thinking about these words. Immensely proud. So I've skipped over some sections, guys. So I've moved ahead to a moment where he wakes up proud to realize that not only had I written so much um, at one time, but I'd written words that I never knew were in the world. Moreover, with a little effort, I could also remember what many of these words meant. Okay, so we see this situation evolving, right? We see him growing, we see him learning, and that he's now, he's feeling pride. So we get more emotions, what he's feeling along the way. We got envy up here at the beginning of this, right? Um, we get to a place where, you know, I was going to quit, so lack of motivation, but then motivation happens. We get pride. Um, these are really important things to, to keep in mind because you have to talk about emotions. All right. Now, I'm not going to read through these last parts, but, you know, it's just more of the same, more evolution, all right, more of what's going on in this person's mind as this story is unfolding, as his life is unfolding, and he's becoming more and more educated. Okay, use this, these examples, use this reading to give you ideas of how to draw those stories out of yourself, details, specific experiences. Um, don't just summarize, you know, the whole experience of, you know, one summer, 
my parents did this thing and you know it made me realize x y and z give me some detail details give me some specific days tell me how you were feeling tell me of some different moments that have happened along the way okay that's going to be key in your unit one essay do you guys have any questions about the malcolm x reading anything that you want to talk about that that struck you okay so a few key takeaways from this reading um obviously there's this value of education but there's so many more values that that we can read between the lines in this text um i would say that if we asked malcolm x what this big value is um, he would say probably social justice um, is a key value takeaway for him from this reading right because that is what this education led him toward um, to be to better perform social justice and to try to correct problems that he saw in society you know because as he he tells us as he's doing these readings right like he's experiencing all these these emotions he's coming to all these realizations and he wants to do something about it um so there we could talk about so many different types of values and ideas in this reading. It's so much more um, deep and complex than we have the time to navigate. Um, but hopefully you can see on the surface, more on the surface, at minimum, that value of education. You know, probably most of you also see that value of social justice. We see how it evolves throughout, you know, moments of frustration to moments of pride. Um, and moments of wanting to give up to powering through that sort of thing. Um, we see how the writer's experiences have shaped their values. You know, it's pretty easy to see. And that gives us a lot of insight into who they are, why they feel the way that they do. Okay. Um, we can see moments where that education um, sparked something inside of this writer, it led to action right? It led to him wanting to do things. And that's what values are all about. Values aren't just let me sit back and say, oh, I value this thing. I have to act it out in the world. Okay. If I'm going to hold the value of family as my most important value, then I maybe shouldn't go six months without calling my family or going to see them, right? Because that's not me enacting this value in my life. Um, so that's just kind of one way to think about values. It's very easy to claim a value as your own. That's not always the same as putting it into action in the way that we live. Okay, there's a clear connection between values and actions. So this is something you really have to be thinking about um, as you're telling your stories and talking about your value. Maybe there have been times you realize that you weren't enacting this value and you wanna talk about that. And then times when you were, okay, maybe you always were and you wanna talk about that. Maybe you didn't even realize that it was um, a value to you until now. Okay, so there's so many directions the paper can go, but look for moments like, um, you know, Malcolm X talks about, you know, those moments of, of profound emotion, or seeing something in somebody else that you want to have or you want to be like, um, and then doing the work to get there. A lot of times we can find our values in those places. All right. Through his tone, you know, we see excitement. Um, we see a lot of different emotions. Tone is really important. And finally, whether or not we agree with the beliefs or agendas of the speaker when we read these different types of articles, um, we can still see who they are, how they have been influenced, what has made them this way. And that better opens the doors for dialogue, for discourse, um, a place for us to debate our agreements and disagreements. We can't debate those agreements and disagreements if we don't first understand who, what, why, where did these things come from, right? Um, that makes us better equipped to sit down in that debate, all right? So make sure that these are things that you're looking for in the readings that you're doing and that you're applying to your own brainstorming sessions and writing sessions. All right, similar with Game of Thrones. Um, this is a text that I, we could spend days talking about just one little section, okay? Um, we're not going to do that, but um, it's a similar concept as the Malcolm X reading. Um, obviously, th this is fiction, 
but it doesn't matter because even in fiction, a world has been created for us and we can imagine it being a real place. Um, even if there's, you know, fantastical creatures and strange things going on. Um, so we can kind of use fiction in the same way, in a sense that, you know, a world has been created, personalities have been created, and value systems have been created. And so we can draw things out of the text um, that demonstrate the underlying values of people, of a society, and apply some of those same strategies to our own writing about values and society, okay? So Game of Thrones, um, some of you said you were familiar with this. Some of you may never have seen it, I don't know. Um, the books are some places very different, um, especially as it goes later than the series. But the first book, um, the morning, the very first chapter of the book, this is where it begins, the story begins. The morning had dawned clear and cold with a crispness that hinted at the end of summer. They set forth at daybreak to see a man beheaded, 20 in all, and Bran rode among them, nervous with excitement. This was the first time he had been deemed old enough to go with his lord father and his brothers to see the king's justice done. It was the ninth year of summer and the seventh of Bran's life. Lots of stuff happening in these first few lines of the book. Okay, we get, we get a setting. It's, it's morning, right? Just after dawn. It's a little cool out, crisp, crispness in the air that, you know, kind of hints that fall is, um, is here, winter is here. Um, and our, this group of people um, is, has set forth at daybreak to go witness a beheading. So 20 people, we are told. This character that this chapter is focusing on is Bran. And that's why the, the chapter is titled that way. And he rides with them nervous with excitement, which feels a little strange. Somebody's about to get beheaded and you are nervous but excited. So that tells us a lot about this world and what their, their legal system, you know, kind of looks like. It tells us that um, although this person's nervous about it, you know, they're also excited um, because this is potentially not some odd thing. Um, it's, a, it's a routine, it's normal. This was the first time that he had been deemed old enough to go with his Lord Father and his brothers to see the King's justice done. We have lords, we have kings. Again, now we know something about this political, this world politically. Um, it was the ninth year of summer, odd. Okay, that, that should jump out to us as a weird thing outside of our normal world. And the seventh of Bran's life. So we get this, this character is a child. He's seven years old, but he's been deemed old enough to go witness this beheading. So um, that tells us a lot about age in this world. You know, is it for boys and girls? We don't yet know, but we know that seven is apparently considered um, responsible or capable of handling a beheading. So, you know, we can learn a lot about the world in that way. Um, and it says here that they are going to see the king's justice done. So this beheading is being seen as justice. Um, so immediately we can assume that some type of crime must have been committed and that this is the punishment for said crime um, as enacted or ordered by a king. Okay, S stick with me for a minute. The man had been taken outside a small hold fast in the hills. Rob thought he was a wildling, his sword sworn to Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall. It made Bran's skin prickle to think of it. He remembered the hearth tales old Nan told them. The wildlings were cruel men, she said, slavers and slayers and thieves. They consorted with giants and ghouls, stole girl children in the dead of night, and drank blood from polished horns. And their women lay with the others in the long night to sire terrible half-human children. All right, so there are lots happening in this section that can tell us some more things about this world that these characters live in, right? Um, 
Rob. So here's, we have another character in the story, um, aside from Bran. He thinks that this person that's about to get beheaded is a wildling. So this, you know, particular kind of person. Um, Bran, his skin prickles when he thinks that maybe he's about to see a wildling. Okay, so this is a big deal because he's heard stories, right? Old Nan, this other person has told stories around the hearth, around the fireplace in the home about the wildlings. And she says they're cruel men, they're slavers, they're thieves. They do all these bad children. They abduct um, girls and they drink blood and that their women lay with the others. We don't know who the others are yet in the long night to sire terrible half-human children. We know that the wildlings are men, like, you know, they're people. So if they're laying with the others to sire half-human children, we can deduce that the others are considered non-human in some way, right? We can take a lot away from this passage when we read it closely, carefully, word for word. Okay, this is what academic close reading looks like. Um, where we try to figure some things out. All right, so it's interesting. Bran's nervous because he's like, oh, I've, what a wildling. They're, they're terrible people. But um, once he sees him, hold on, guys. Once he sees um, this man, um, he sees that he's bound head and foot to the whole fast wall awaiting the king's justice and that he's old and scrawny, not much taller than Rob. He had lost both ears and a finger to frostbite and he dressed in all black, the same as a brother of the Night's Watch, except that his furs were ragged and greasy. So we get that immediate like, wait a minute, that's not what he's supposed to look like. I've heard stories about these guys and they're awful, horrible people and strong and you know capable of destruction. But now when Bran sees him, you know, he's probably a little disappointed because this guy looks like our brothers from the Night's Watch. He kind of looks like us. Like there's what's so scary about him. He's old and he's scrawny. Okay, so this is important. We're seeing this realization that Bran's having about these stories that he's been told and now what he's seeing in real life. The breath of the man and horse mingled steaming in the cold morning air as his lord father um, had the man cut down from the wall and dragged before them. Rob and John sat tall and steel on their horses with Bran between them on his pony, trying to seem older than seven, trying to pretend that he'd seen all of this before. A faint wind blew through the hold fast gates over their heads flat and the banner of the Starks of Winterfell, um, a great dire wolf racing across an ice white field. All right, so we st we start to learn quite a bit more at this point about who these people are. Right, we know that who this family is. Okay, and that's really important to keep in mind. The more we learn about them, the more we can understand the value systems, the type of world they live in. The same thing with you. When you're writing about yours, the more we know, the more you can tell us some details and things about your family or your parents that's going to give us some insight into you. Fran's father sat solemnly on his horse, long brown hair stirring in the wind. His closely trimmed beard was shot with white, making him look older than his 35 years. He had a grim cast to his gray eyes this day. And he seemed not at all the man who would sit before the fire in the evening and talk softly of the age of heroes and children of the forest. He had taken off father's face, Bran thought, and donned the face of Lord Stark of Winterfell. Okay, so we get, again, more information. Bran's father, he's somebody important, right? He is a lord. Um, and Bran is seeing his father probably for the first time in this position of power as a lord. He says, wait a minute, this isn't dad, the nice guy who's all happy and warm at night telling us stories. Um, this is him looking solemn, serious, maybe sad. 
He's got long brown hair and he's only 35 years old, but he already has gray. So he's probably endures a lot of stress um, in the work that he has to do. His grim, uh, there's a grim cast to his gray eyes. So he probably doesn't take pleasure in this task of fulfilling justice, right? So we can learn a lot of things, you know, about this person. There's probably some honor there who will do this job out of duty but doesn't necessarily take pleasure in it, right? Um, so we can learn a lot through this type of a close reading, those details. Um, you can give your readers a whole lot of information, guys, just by including little details, telling, telling us things like that, describing you know, the expressions that people are making as your stories are unfolding, describing the emotions, describing the weather, or the, if, is it a changing of the seasons? Is there an event that has happened um, that is impacting this moment. Okay, all of those types of details are really want make a narrative compelling, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. That's what keeps us reading. Okay, if you say certain things, because now if I stop after those first few sections, I need to know more. I want to know why is this person being executed? Um, obviously, the Lord is not happy about having to do it. So will he do it? Like, what if maybe he'll change his mind? Um, we know that he doesn't if we read on, right? We see that he does do it. And he tells Bran that he who passes the sentences should swing the sword. So in other words, if you're not willing to kill that person yourself, then you should not be the one sentencing them to die. If you're going to sentence a person to die, um, then you should have what it takes to, you know, commit the killing, um, which is interesting. That tells us a lot about this value system, this, this idea of justice that they hold in this society, in this world, okay? And we can deduce a lot. We could talk about all kinds of values in there because of that. Um, so hopefully you started to see some of those things too, and you can develop ideas for how to dig a little bit deeper into your own stories so that you can bring that to life on the paper for your reader. Um, using things, you know, characters, tone, um, gender roles that you notice being espoused, you know, things like that are really going to make a difference to your reader, keep them hooked, and keep them reading your essay to the end. All right, so... A lot of ways um, that you can become better academic readers and writers, guys, this is our ultimate goal. That's what I want you to take away from this class this semester. Um, it's about learning how to be a better reader and a better writer. These things are really important um, to being successful at the university and beyond. So one thing you can do is just pay attention. Start paying attention to the world around you, exploring how pop culture can demonstrate social values. Um, values of an entire society. If we have a music artist that every household in the country is obsessed with, that might tell us some things. Why? Um, we can learn a lot about the values of our society based on pop culture. What is wildly popular in our culture or in particular cultures? And those things can tell us a lot about one another. So pay attention. Um, pay attention in the readings that you do to focus on implicit values what is beneath the surface okay we don't always need the character or the person to come right out and tell us um, but we can deduce a lot by their actions the things that they've been through the things they believe in okay so we want to read everything critically films music um, photographs everything that we encounter start learning to look a little deeper and ask what is the argument because everyone is constantly trying to convince us of things okay but we want to read with the intent to understand um, not to agree we don't have to you know listen to somebody you know trying to make ourselves agree with them but we do want to try to understand what they're saying and why um, so make sure that, you know, these are the things that you're trying to work on as the semester goes on with readings, with your daily writings, it's being open-minded, being willing to listen to other ideas. Um, this exchange of ideas has a lot of power to benefit you, okay, here at the university. 
and beyond. Um, but obviously our, our main goal is to improve our writing and communication skills. And the, these are the steps to doing that. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, writing a thesis or working line of inquiry. So this is something that um, we talked a little bit about in class on Tuesday, and we'll, we will be talking more about in classes next week, but you should try to put together some sort of thesis or working line of inquiry for your homework assignment. So a thesis or working line of inquiry is a question that your paper will try to solve. Um, so in other words, what is your value? Um, what has shaped this value for you? Okay, many of your theses and lines of inquiry are going to look very similar because you are writing to a prompt. Um, you're going to sum up your value and why you have it, right? So an example might be the value of family is important to me because, and of course you'll tell me why, and reflecting on my past experience has made me realize X, Y, and Z, all right? Fill in the blanks. Um, as you write the paragraph for the homework assignments in this unit, you want to reflect back on this lesson today, on these readings that we looked closely at and how they use details, right? Um, try to include a thesis or working line of inquiry in tonight's homework submission, but really most importantly, focus on those details. Focus on how to become a better storyteller, how to explicitly talk about your value so it's very clear to the reader throughout your essay. And then also those implicit moments where you're just using language that makes it clear what value you're talking about. Okay, so homework for next class. Um, you're gonna review the student sample essays one more time, reading notes so far, class notes, assignments, all of the things you've done in these first two weeks. Um, and then you're gonna read Zadie Smith's Joy. So I mentioned this in class on Tuesday. Um, I, I jumped the gun a little bit, got to it a little bit early, but you guys are gonna read Joy, read it closely. Think about the values that she's addressing, how she represents them, um, but also language choices, okay? How she uses language to get you to continue reading, to draw you in. You're gonna read Anne Lamott's shitty first drafts on the additional readings resources page in the first module. So remember that page is gonna link you um, to my website where you can find a lot of additional resources throughout the semester. Um, this reading is really short. It's literally a page, so you can read it quickly. But it's a good reminder as you're getting ready to really start drafting um, to keep in mind that the first draft is, it's called a rough draft for a reason. Okay, it doesn't need to be perfect. The goal is to get something on paper. And then also on that website, you're going to find the 1113 Unit 1 planning document that I uploaded for you, that I created for you. Um, so that just talks about some different ways of pre-writing. Obviously, you're probably familiar with the traditional outline, but there are some other strategies that might work better for you and your writing style. All right, so you wanna use all of this pre-writing that you've done so far to begin to organize your writing into at the start of a rough draft. Okay, ideally, you're getting a partial draft, so around six, 700 words, completed before class next Tuesday. Okay, that rough draft is coming up quickly. So um, use the weekend, use these extra days to get started, right? Storytelling, showing me how your value has evolved throughout your life, all right? Remember that the bulk of the essay is gonna be stories and experiences from your past. So that's a good place to start for the rough draft. You can clean it up and organize it later. The goal is to get something on paper, okay? All right, guys, um, if you have any questions, reach out to me. Uh, you can email me. I can meet with you. I can meet with you all throughout the day today. I'm very available, right? So after you finish watching the video, reach out. Let me know if you have a question. Thanks, guys.